I'm Teresa Miguel Stearns, the Law Librarian, and welcome to the inaugural event of the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. This is a series that was started by my predecessor many years ago, and I proudly carry this tradition on today. We have a, a, an amazing, prolific faculty, so it's just great for us to have a forum where we can introduce their scholarship and their books to our students and our, uh, our fellow faculty members and friends of the law school, and, and they can talk about uh, their, their ideas and their thoughts and, and their scholarship. A special welcome to our new JD class of 2021 and our new LLM graduate students um, class of 2019. So this evening's book talk brings together two long-term beloved and devoted members of the Yale Law School faculty, professors Peter Grimm and Bruce Ackerman, to discuss Professor Grimm's two, two of his three new books since the last book talk, uh, which is The Constitution of European Democracy and Ich bin ein Freund der Verfassung. Peter Grimm was a visiting professor here at Yale Law School for many, many years. In fact, just last fall was his last semester teaching here. So we're very fortunate to have him back for just a few weeks, uh, just a, enough of a window for us to squeeze in this book talk where we can celebrate his most recent publications. Professor Grimm also teaches at the Institute of Advanced Study and Humboldt University in Berlin, and he's a former justice of the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany from 1987 to 1999. Professor Grimm has published widely on constitutional law, history and theory, comparative constitutionalism, and European Union law. He's been a visiting professor at institutions around the world, uh, in addition to Yale, including Harvard, NYU, Toronto, Rome, Seoul, Beijing, Kolkata, Shanghai, you get the idea. Um, he's also been a fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study in South Africa. Professor Grimm is a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Research Academy, the European Academy, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Commentary and insight this evening is Prof Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science here at Yale, Bruce Ackerman. Bruce Acker Professor Ackerman is the author of at least 18 books that have had a broad influence in political philosophy, constitutional law, and public policy. A couple of his major works include The Social Justice in the Liberal States and uh, his multi volume constitutional history, We the People. His most recent project, Revolutionary Constitutionalism, is well underway. And we may have a book talk for Professor Ackerman before we know it as well. In addition to his many books, Professor Ackerman also writes for the general public, uh, contributing frequently to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and, like today, the Huffington Post. Professor Ackerman is a member of the American Law Institute and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a commander of the French Order of Merit and recipient of the American Philosophical Society's Henry Phillips Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Jurisprudence. Please join me in welcoming Professors uh, Bruce Ackerman and Dieter Grimm this evening. Well, uh, uh, Dieter really uh, has had a tremendous impact on me in the law school. Uh, he uh, was a founding member of uh, the Constitutionalism Seminar, uh, uh, which has been in sessions for the last 25 years, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in which um, uh, judges from around the world, constitutional court judges from around the world, come uh, fly, fly in amazingly uh, to New Haven uh, uh, each year. Uh, uh, we prepare uh, 200, 250 pages, uh, which they read on, they actually read on the airplane uh, coming in. <laughs> the further away they are, the more informed they are. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, and uh, with that, uh, they uh, talk to one another. And it, uh, 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 and they actually do. Uh, uh, and since there are, are a few uh, people like Dieter uh, who uh, propel this thing forward, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, this has, uh, you know, uh, this has been uh, an eye opener for me. It was one of the things, indeed, that uh, um, propelled me into comparative constitutional law. And uh, also, 
a friendship with Peter. The uh, uh, fact of the matter is, it's not so easy to make friends when you're 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and we've managed. <laughs> Um, uh, my uh, job today uh, is, uh, uh, since one of my, uh, uh, the, one of the facts is that I actually can uh, read German and, uh, and I speak it uh, with uh, uh, enthusiasm and uh, strategic uh, uh, grammatical mistakes. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, so people don't know if I've just said some really profound idea or just mistook the idea with us, you know. And, uh, the truth is. Uh, too often the grammatical one. Um, uh, so ich bin ein Freund der Verfassung is, uh, uh, I can really uh, uh, associate with uh, that, uh, with uh, Peter. And, uh, uh, it tells, uh, it's a, a series of dialogues, um, uh, and the uh, most uh, fascinating ones were the, for me, uh, were the early ones. Um, so Dieter uh, is seven years old. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, his uh, native town is uh, just devastated. Uh, uh, his uh, father, um, uh, like, uh, is uh, a uh, 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 is a railroad uh, 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 person on, uh, who is a uh, railroad uh, helping to run the railroad in his area, and so is not sent off to work. Uh, and moreover, uh, although he didn't uh, go to college, uh, was a beyond him. Uh, and this was a uh, civil servant, uh, and this was significant. Uh, uh, there was, um, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and it's uh, significant uh, for me as well, since my father, uh, 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 also didn't go to college uh, and um, uh, uh, avoided the army uh, both by my birth, but that wasn't quite enough. Uh, uh, he uh, 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 was uh, making uh, pants for the army. Uh, the, uh, uh, in any event, Peter and I uh, have another thing in common. Uh, uh, we do great on standardized tests. <laughs> and uh, it was this skill that propelled Peter Grimm forward uh, to a leading uh, amongst all this rubble. Uh, really, I mean, uh, you could just imagine. Uh, uh, to uh, an outstanding uh, uh, gymnasium uh, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, forward uh, to uh, 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 really extraordinary scholarships, which permitted him to go uh, to first of France uh, uh, and an elite institution, and then uh, to uh, Harvard, uh, uh, where um, uh, 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 in, in the year was uh, 1964, um, and his experiences is uh, 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 recounted here, uh, he says, uh, this really uh, uh, changed my life in two ways. One, this was uh, the year in which Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson were running. Uh, and uh, it was you know, a real turning point in uh, uh, democratic uh, politics. And um, in contrast to the very legalistic um, form of excellent French education. Um, uh, uh, the Harvard Law School was an eye-opener, especially uh, uh, Harvard Sachs. And the idea that there was something called a legal process in which government in the larger sphere was actually engaged uh, uh, in the construction of the uh, activist state and the uh, role of the judiciary in modern times. Uh, uh, he uh, managed to be so impressive that um, um, uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, movement to uh, get him on the faculty of Harvard Law School. Uh, or, uh, but in the meantime, uh, 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 
Maybe he got a cushy job off of a ropes and gray. <laughs> uh, um, and this was a moment of truth. After all, uh, what we have here is uh, still a Germany in the bowl. He could have stayed here uh, and become the, you know, big, great German scholar uh, that had transcended uh, 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 international uh, boundaries and, and then you know, return in triumph to uh, uh, an insecure Germany. This is not what he did. After thinking it over, he went back uh, to uh, Germany. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, and instead um, uh, found himself uh, 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 in this extraordinary, as is portrayed here, intellectual environment. Once again, uh, rather than sort of narrow dogmatics, um, he found himself in a place where uh, he was engaged in this intensive interdisciplinary uh, uh, seminar with Nicholas Luhmann, who was once again trying to put the legal and constitutional system, political system, in this larger context. Not that he, as he says in this book, I, I was never a true Luhmannian. Uh, but he's confronting that. And, what, and then, uh, instead of, uh, and then he is involved in getting his, uh, 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 in the history of German legal and constitutional development. Not in you know, narrow nitpicking, which was, after all, uh, uh, by comparison to the French, the Germans are uh, different. Uh, they, uh, but nonetheless, they are uh, you know, dogmatics is the central thing, and that's not what he was doing. Uh, uh, he was uh, doing historical contextualization of this new the meaning of this new German, uh, uh, and. Uh, 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 putting himself into these multidisciplinary debates, both in the United States and in uh, Germany, and in, in a way that was extremely risk-taking for an up-and-coming uh, uh, legal scholar. Indeed, uh, um, as he says, uh, when he, amazingly enough, uh, uh, gets a professorship, uh, uh, it was only because the two real candidates dropped out ahead of time, and then they were desperate, thinking because maybe uh, they lose the job, so they said, Grim, come here. And so at the age of some, some small age, uh, uh, he becomes a professor. Uh, the, uh, uh, I think that, uh, 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 and, uh, begins uh, uh, work on private law and uh, this historical stuff and thinking about the interdisciplinary dimension. Uh, and uh, when he is uh, 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 called to the court, the German court. Uh, and, 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 and my last words is that uh, uh, the, in these wonderful interviews, he uh, uh, confesses that he was never interested in doctrine. This is not what I was ever interested in. And this is a remarkable uh, uh, recommendation uh, for uh, a, one of the uh, most distinguished German doctrinalists and <laughs> judges <laughs> developing the doctrine of the Constitution. Uh, 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 quite a remarkable uh, story, which uh, 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 I uh, now uh, turn over to Peter so that he can uh, tell you what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to start with the demand. Uh, it's not true that I not, was not interested in doctrine. Uh, but as a matter of fact, I didn't work very much in doctrine <laughs> because I think everybody in Germany is working doctrinally. Uh, and uh, I'm able to do that, but I think German doesn't need more doctrinal type of uh, legal research, but more this contextual type that uh, Bruce described. And of course, as a member of the court, uh, what do I do other than uh, uh, solve uh, cases and issues uh, by applying legal doctrine? Yeah. And, uh, 
if I had not been interested in it, I would have not been able to do it, I would have been in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, well, the proofs concentrated on this uh, biographical uh, book. I will more concentrate on the European book, but just one word which might be interesting to uh, an American audience. Uh, biographies of uh, judges in the United States, or autobiographies of judges, uh, are a normal thing. Uh, this does not exist uh, in Europe. Uh, it, is, uh, it would be extremely difficult uh, to find anything autobiographical uh, biogra biographical, uh, uh, about uh, judges. Uh, and why is this so? <coughs> just occurred to me on my way here uh, that the late Justice Scalia once told me a story. Uh, as probably everybody here knows, uh, Scalia had many children, and one of his daughters uh, spent a year of an internship in Germany and lived with the German family, and the German family said, uh, what's your family, what is your father? Uh, and at that time, uh, her father was not yet a uh, Supreme Court Justice, but was a professor, I think, in Chicago. And so she said he's a professor at the University of Chicago, and the family, the German family, was extremely proud to host the daughter of that professor. So a few years later, the girl visited this family again, and uh, they said, how is your father? And she proudly said, he is now a judge. And the family said, why this decline? <laughs> shows some of the differences. In Germany, judges are anonymous people. They are not known to the general public. Uh, uh, when you have a, uh, an opinion, this opinion will be signed by all judges who participated in the procedure, but you wouldn't know who wrote it. You wouldn't know whether it was a unanimous decision or a split vote. Uh, and if you were asked uh, an ordinary German in the streets, uh, do you the name of uh, a few judges, you would uh, get the answer no. And if you happen to meet uh, someone with the legal training, he or she would probably know the name of the president of the Constitutional Court, but this is more or less uh, all. Uh, so this is unusual, and it, uh, uh, I hesitated uh, to do it, because it was far for me ever to write an autobiography. Uh, and, and I, thought, I also thought, who wants to read that in, in, in Europe? I thought a few colleagues will look whether they appear in that book or not. But it wasn't so. It was, it was surprisingly uh, well uh, received and, and so on. So I think this is an, experience, an interesting difference between our country. It had also something to do, of course, with the difference between common law and civil law. Common law is a judge-made law. Civil law is a legislative uh, law. And the judge is supposed to apply the law. And the law, we do not believe it, but in the 19th century and the early 20th century, it was believed that the law, the codification, has an answer for every legal problem that comes up. And so it doesn't matter who sits on the bench and decides. It doesn't matter because every judge is at least uh, supposed to reach the same uh, decision. This is not only what we believe, but the general attitude different between common law and civil law still exists, although there is a lot of conversions. Uh, now, a few words to, uh, with regard to the, to the book on, uh, on Europe. Uh, I think everybody also in the United States uh, is uh, aware that the European Union suffers from a legitimacy deficit an acceptance problem. The European Union is not a state, but is a, uh, an organization of states. And I think this makes quite a difference. Uh, if you live in a state, you may be dissatisfied with the politics of that state. You may be dissatisfied with the political parties. You may think that politics is on the wrong way, but you don't question the existence of the state. Uh, and this is different in the European Union. Uh, people do not only agree or disagree with European politics, but uh, the, the, the existence of the European Union itself is questioned. Is it useful or is it more detrimental to uh, uh, our own country? 
Uh, and since this is so, there is of course a lot of discussion uh, about the question what are the sources uh, of these uh, acceptance crises of the European Union, which did not exist in the very beginning of the European Union in the 1950s, but uh, uh, came later. And the answer that is mostly given in European countries is the main reason is that the European Parliament is not in the center of, a, of the European Union, not the only organ, the only institution that is directly elected by the citizens is not the center of this institution. But since it is an organization of states, but not a state itself, in the center of the structure of the European Union is the institution in which the governments of the member states are represented, and this is the Council of the European uh, Union. Uh, so people who think that this is the source of the problem uh, suggest that we transform the European Union into a parliamentary system, like many states have it. That's to say the parliament is the central elects the government, etc. Well, what I am trying to develop in that book is that this is a wrong perception of the sources of the European uh, problems. And uh, I think that there is uh, uh, another source which is much more important than uh, uh, the question about the European uh, Parliament, uh, but a source which is almost uh, completely overlooked. And I call it the over-constitutionalization of the European Union. This is the central thesis of it. There's much more in it, but this is the central uh, uh, point. Uh, now you will perhaps say, uh, in, in order to be over-constitutionalized, you have to be constitutionalized in the first place. Uh, and how can you be over-constitutionalized without having a constitution? Uh, and uh, uh, there is, of course, some truth in it because the European Union, the legal foundation of the European Union, is not a constitution. It is a treaty under international law, and it can only be changed in the same way as it was concluded by amending a treaty by unanimous uh, agreement of uh, the, the, the member states. So, uh, why is the European Union constitutionalized? before we can ask whether uh, it is over-constitutionalized. This is the moment and the point where the European Court of Justice uh, comes in. And the European Court of Justice, in two early judgments, foundation of the EU 1957, two judgments of the European Court of Justice in 1963 and 64, declare, declare that European law applies directly within the member states and that it enjoys supremacy over the law of the member states. Direct application means the treaties do not contain, not only contain obligations of the member states to establish the common market, but uh, the treaties also uh, contain direct rights of the citizens, and this applies uh, uh, most importantly to the four economic freedoms. They were the idea was that they give the guidelines for the establishment of the common market. Guidelines for national law, to adjust their national law, to European law, and guidelines for the European legislature. But these decisions of the court turned them into subjective entitlements of the citizens, so that if citizens thought that national law uh, uh, is an impediment to their economic activities and violates the foreign economic freedoms. They could sue their own country before the national courts. And if the national courts thought there may be a uh, contradiction between European law and national, they had to hand the case over to the European law, accept the answer, and continue on uh, that basis. And as I said, supremacy of the European law, and if there is a contradiction, then national law uh, gives way, and national law is no longer applicable. So interestingly enough, it was the United States observers, some United States scholars of European law, uh, who saw what, uh, who realized what had happened, and they called it these two judgments, the effect of these two judgments was a constitutionalization of the treaties. 
which does not mean, of course, that the treaties became a constitution that could not be uh, uh, in the hands of a court. Uh, that could only be done by the member states. But uh, it meant that they now uh, have the effects of a constitution. Uh, I think it's fair to say that these two judgments were revolutionary. Uh, they were revolutionary in various respects. First of all, nothing of direct effect, nothing of supremacy was in the text of the treaties. Uh, they were secondly revolutionary because it was uh, an atypical approach to international law at that time. Changes, the things have changed, but international law obliged states but had no impact on citizens whatsoever. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the European Court of Justice chose to interpret European law not like international law, but like uh, national constitutional law. And uh, I think uh, it was these uh, two judgments that uh, uh, transformed the European Union in, in this uh, very unique, unprecedented political entity that it is now, somewhere between uh, a uh, confederation and a federal state, but closer to a federal state than to a confederation. And fourthly, it was a self-empowerment of the European Court uh, uh, of Justice. Now, my question in the book is not, uh, were these decisions legally correct or not correct? They have been accepted, uh, meanwhile. We uh, have lived with them for 50 years, and I think it's not uh, worth uh, discussing historically were they correct at that time. But what I'm interested in is uh, uh, the consequences for the legitimacy problem of the European Union. Uh, and the immediate consequence uh, of these judgments was that the member states were no longer needed to establish the common market. The court could now take this into its own hands by abolishing all national law that the court thought, thought was in contradiction with the European law. And this meant that we from now on, from that moment on, had two pathways to European integration. One provided for in the treaties, that's to say making the treaties, amending the treaties, making European law, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the other way, through the interpretation, to a very broad, extensive interpretation of the existing uh, 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 treaties. The first way was political. It included the political institutions of the member states and of the European Union. Uh, the second way was non-political, was administrative and judicial, and uh, excluded the political uh, institution and uh, circumvented the democratic uh, process. Now, everything now depended, of course, on how did the European Court understand, interpret, develop uh, uh, European law. And I think we can say the court did it with considerable zeal. Uh, a number of scholars say the court had an agenda, is a court with an agenda. It's the court's business to promote the establishment and the maintenance of the common market, especially in times where the member states, mostly because of France's reluctance to continue with integration, remained uh, rather uh, passive. Uh, this means that uh, uh, the European Court constantly pushed national law back and expanded at the same time uh, the scope of European law. And this was most notably, of course, the case for the four economic freedoms, freedom of uh, uh, the goods, freedom of, uh, uh, freedom of capital, freedom of services, and what did I forget? Freedom of, uh, of work, of the, of the, uh, the workforce. <clears throat> now, it is interesting to get it, 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 uh, uh, it uh, was the, was the cause for uh, uh, deep inroads into national law. Uh, nation states could no longer upheld their own standards of, let's say, consumer protection, <coughs> labor protection, etc. <coughs> uh, member states could no longer decide on what they would leave to the market and what they would like to uh, take in their, their own hands, and all this was uh, handed over. And, uh, 
then it's interesting to see that the European Court of Justice could contribute to European integration only in a negative way. That's to say the court could only abolish national law, but it couldn't fill the gaps that, that were left by the abolition of national law. Uh, this could have been done by making European law, but of course the court couldn't make European law. Abolishing national law was a stroke of the pen of the European Court of Justice. Making European law is a difficult process. Uh, with the Commission, only the only institution to have the right to take the initiative, and then you need an agreement of the member states and you need the consent of the European Parliament. Uh, so very often, uh, uh, national law was abolished, but the gaps were not filled by European law. Sometimes it worked, it worked in environmental law, it worked very well, in other areas not. And so I think this is one of the explanations of the liberalizing effect of the jurisprudence of the European Court. It has its basis in the constitutionalization. The court can abolish national law with a stroke of the pen, it cannot fill the gaps. And so we have an inbuilt, structural inbuilt momentum vis-a-vis -vis liberalization. And the European Union is more liberalized than every member state without perhaps the United States would want it uh, uh, to be. Uh, now, one can see the full implications of that only if one looks to the object that was constitutionalized by these two decisions, namely the treaties. And when you compare the treaties with the Constitution, you see the sheer the, the difference when you compare the sheer volume. Uh, you can perhaps uh, measure a Constitution in millimeters. I don't know what the English-American equivalent is. And the European treaties are a book which you measure in uh, uh, centimeters. Uh, why is that so? So, because the member state, when they concluded the treaties in 1957, they were not aware that they were writing a constitution, uh, but they wrote an international treaty where you should be as detailed as possible in order to tell what the obligations of the various partners uh, are. Uh, so, what do we find in a constitution of a state? We find maybe something of the purpose of the state. We find something about its institutions, the structure, uh, uh, the powers, the division of labor between various institutions, or between, if you have a federal state, between federal level and state level. Uh, you may have uh, a bill of rights. Uh, so we can say constitution regulate the political decision making, but they leave the political decisions to uh, the democratic process. And I think this distinction between the constitutional level and the ordinary law level is crucial for constitutionalism. And this is why we can say, and I say it in the book, the more constitution, the less democracy. Now, the European treaties are full of what would be ordinary law in every member state. Imagine that the whole antitrust laws is in the US Constitution. Imagine that half, you don't have a commercial code, I think, but you have a number of the commercial common law, and you certainly have a number of codifications that concern business law. Imagine all this would be in the uh, US Constitution. So this is the case uh, that we have. The treaties do not consist only of constitutional provisions, but they are full of ordinary law. But nevertheless, all this in its nature, ordinary law, now participates in the effects of constitutionalization. And this is what I call the over-constitutionalization of the European Union. The consequence is everything that is regulated on treaty level, so quasi-constitutional level, is withdrawn from politics. This is what we have constitutions for. And this is also why constitutions restrain themselves to a few very important principles. So everything that is regulated on treaty level is withdrawn from politics. That means for you, everything that is in its nature ordinary law is nevertheless withdrawn from politics. So we get a tremendous power shift from the democratic institutions to the executive and judicial institutions in the European Union. Uh, the democratically legitimated and accountable organs are out of the game as far as the treaty 
within the scope of its tenets. The political institutions, the democratic institutions cannot participate, but they also cannot change things because the institutions are below the constitutions, not above uh, the constitution. The only way you could correct the line of jurisprudence of the court would be to amend the treaties, but uh, everybody knows that uh, amending the European treaties is even more difficult than amending the US uh, constitution. So decisions of the highest political impact uh, in the European Union uh, are taken in a non-political mode. And the, EU, the EU citizens, I think, as a consequence of this, see themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis a state of integration that they have never been asked for uh, to say yes or no, but they cannot change either if they uh, dislike it. And so you may see that a better equipment of the European Parliament, the concern of most people who are looking for the legitimacy that he sees, better equipment of the European Parliament wouldn't help at all to change anything in the slightest because the Parliament is under the Constitution and not uh, above uh, the Constitution. So, I'm not saying that this is the only source of European problems, but I think it's the most unnoticed source and a very important uh, source. Can one do something? Yeah, it would be quite easy, legally it would be quite easy. Just take all the provisions that in their nature are not constitutional law, but ordinary law. Take them out of the treaties and downgrade them to European secondary law to European legislative law. And then you open the doors for the democratic institutions. Politically, it's extremely difficult. It would require a treaty amendment. And if it is true what I just said about the difficulties of treaty amendment in Europe, there's little hope that we will not reach this uh, form. Okay, so much uh, with regard to the, the other of the European book.